rebirth uh, when we were going through kind of new age uh, epic in the in, uh, in, at least in modern times. Uh, and I started researching crystals, and pretty soon I got uh, interested in this guy named Marcel Vogel, who for 30 years was an IBM scientist. He invented a bunch of stuff. He's got all these patents to his name, uh, like the modern hard drive disk coding, the magnetic disk coding, and the strip on the back of your credit card, debit card. He invented those things at IBM. Uh, and when he retired from IBM, he became interested in crystal healing. So really interesting character. This has like total, you know, dualistic split between like rational hard science, smart, obviously smart guy, uh, and then this very kind of mystical occult science on the other hand. Uh, and I think we all have a little bit of that, but he's got a lot of it. Right? Like those are two very different things. Uh, and here he is giving a lecture about this crystal that he he designed the geometry for it. It's called a Vogel cut crystal. Uh, and he traveled throughout Europe and the US giving lectures and selling these very expensive crystals to people who were interested in his ideas. Uh, and I think one of the reasons that they're interested in his ideas is because he was a scientist at IBM, and IBM was especially huge in the 70s. Uh, so, yeah, so he has this cred from being a scientist and working at a computer company in the time when computers are becoming a part of the kind of everyday lexicon, right? People are starting to kind of own their own personal computers. And here's this guy that, like, worked on computers. Uh, so I started working with his ideas and sort of translating those into visual art projects. So I bought some Vogel cut crystals, uh, knockoffs, uh, can't afford the real ones. Uh, so the geometry is a little funky, but they're patterned off of his design where you have this double terminated quartz crystal with a specific number of facets at specific angles. And this is made by dragging the crystal across the scanner as the scanner is passing. Uh, so the lid is just up and they're just holding the crystal and kind of tracing the light with the crystal. Um, and you get this beautiful kind of refracted light as a way of maybe testing his ideas, thinking about like what he thought a crystal could do, which is maybe hold thought and power and love and then project it and amplify it. So here I am kind of holding the light and then projecting the light and scattering it and sort of thinking about testing, testifying to um, his ideas through this very kind of physical process. Um, and in the dark room, I'm making these into photograms. So again, holding the crystals and putting them on a light sensitive um, silver gelatin paper, shining light through it and sort of seeing what results. So it's this very experimental process. And I'm thinking about like Vogel in his lab, seeing all this IBM equipment that he, you know, got from IBM after he retired to kind of test out these geometries, test out these crystals. And here is a kind of way of like embodying that spirit of um, in, in making something and testing something. Uh, I don't know that it proves anything, but they're really beautiful, I think. Um, and they can create some very kind of interesting and intriguing images. I hired, a, I hired a, a courtroom sketch artist to draw some of his quote unquote miracles. So here he is, a, he's giving a talk on plant communication that is like plants communicating uh, in London. And he talks in a video about levitating a woman. So I hired a corporate sketch artist to illustrate this idea. Because of course there's no images of it. Because of course it maybe didn't happen. Um, and so there we have somebody's interpretation of his first person telling of this narrative. Um, and then this is my like diptych piece to it, where I actually levitate a chair. Uh, literally on crystals. So this chair is balancing on four vocal cut crystals. Uh, it's got a plant from the lecture, and this is called um, Levitation. It's an after for some vocal. And uh, let's see, oh, here we go. I also uh, made a bunch of crystals uh, out of various materials, again, as a way of kind of testing out materials and thinking about the way in which these materials can hold uh, information. So sawdust, uh, wax, chalk, plastic, clay, plaster, paper, resin, uh, styrofoam, walnut, dirt, foam, birch, chalk, etc., etc. It goes on and on and on, continuing this project. Uh, that's another one of his supposed miracles. Uh, I gotta speed up a little bit. There's the video. Uh, I gotta move past that. Okay, bad luck, hot rocks. Uh, this is a project in which, when I was out in Arizona photographing meteorites or meteorons, 
uh, we took a detour to go to, my wife and I took a detour to go to the Petrified Forest National Park, and we encountered a series of letters that people wrote to the park, returning rocks that they had stolen from the park. And these letters say things like, you know, I've had bad luck ever since I stole this, my RV broke down, my dog died. They sound like country and western songs sometimes. Um, you know, my wife left me. Uh, other times it's like, my husband died in a plane crash near the park, you know, like, and so here's the rock, like, I don't want anything to do with it. Or my cat, my cat got cancer, you know, so it, it runs the gamut. Uh, I got really interested in these letters because they testify to a kind of power that people are ascribing to this, you know, otherwise, like, inert mineral. Um, and people believe this to be true, and if they believe it to be true, I don't know if I'm willing to tell them they're totally crazy, uh, but I'm really interested in the way that they're kind of digging into geology and thinking about, like, whether or not they should have taken that thing out of its place in the first place. And it becomes a metaphor, then, too, for the kind of use of natural resources more broadly, whether it's, you know, coal or oil or, put, you know, insert your natural resource here. Uh, this is kind of this microcosmic scale for a kind of macrocosmic scale in which we're like completely terraforming the Earth in ways that will have long-lasting impacts. Uh, there's the park, there's the letters that they that I first encountered that are no longer there. They're kind of trying to reshape the image of the park. Uh, there's a rock. I was talking to a ranger when we were there the first time, and someone walked in and returned this like while we were talking. And that was a letter. Here's a, here's what they look like when they don't get packaged very well, <laughs> and they're very heavy. Um, it's badlands mostly, it's a really interesting landscape. It's just, these are some snapshots. And then here's what they call the conscience pile, which is where they dump the rocks when they come back to the park. They can't return the rocks to the park, because if they did, it would spoil that site for research. They don't know if it came to the park, they don't know what direction it was facing. You know, They can't verify anything about that rock without a lot of work. Um, so they dump them here on this private service road in the park. They call this the conscience pile. The letters are called the conscience letters. Uh, and at that rock, this, these are just snapshots again. We photo I went back the following summer and photographed a bunch of the individual rocks. Uh, and similar to the meteor rocks, like the only thing these things have in common is the fact that someone picked it up, maybe not even in the park, right? And sent it back or brought it back to the country forest. So it's a kind of weird pile and it represents, what it represents is this kind of interesting guilty conscience or this like burden of conscience that's like just kind of growing in the park doesn't know when this started and has no plans for it it's just kind of there it's this really weird uh, kind of no man's land um, so we photographed the rocks um, oh shoot i need to um, try to Please allow me to end by saying this. 
So to so those of you who are reading this and thinking the same foolish thoughts I did, please, if you insist on taking home a souvenir, buy one in Winslow. If you don't, then do yourself a favor. Place the rock where you'll be able to find, readily find it. Because when you do finally sit down and write your letter like this one, you won't want to waste time looking for it. Beware. Please sign me, S period, C period. Sorry, Canadian. <laughs> Uh, so that became a book project that was published uh, last fall, or a year ago in the fall, called Bad Luck Hot Rocks, which is a collection of letters. The park has more than 1,500 letters in their archive, and we, we uh, selected about 640 or 50, I, don't, I didn't actually count, 50 letters for a book. And then the photographs that we took at the conscience pile are included. So that's kind of the main way that this project lives on, and since then I've become kind of obsessed with publishing projects. I've got lots of book projects that are ongoing. I really like the way that books go out into the world um, and kind of have a life of their own. You know, this book is showing up at bookstores like all over the world, museums, etc. And that's really fun. It's a very kind of new way of getting my work out into the world. And so I am committed to this idea of publishing more books. Um, and then it also lives on as a, as a visual art project. So this uh, is a show that's up right now, actually, in Munich, Germany at a space called Lothar 13, it's a Kunsthal. Um, and so the letters are just printed out for people to kind of cycle through and read and share with one another. And the rocks are on the wall, and then there's a large scale photograph of this, which we built at the, at the conscience pile, which is a way of thinking about like the rocks in a collective fashion rather than an individual fashion. So this is called Temporary Monument, uh, Bad Luck Hot Rocks Temporary Monument. So it's uh, about seven feet tall, and in the exhibition it's printed to scale. So when you're standing at it, it's a little bit smaller than you are. Thank you for your patience. I'd love to uh, entertain some questions. Or, yeah. <clears throat> or we can go back to anything that you're curious about, too.